As President Trump visits the border, he's backing off his threat to close it. Can cross-border businesses breathe a sigh of relief? A skin-crawling story from a mom at Camp Pendleton. She woke up to find mice running rampant through her home. How she says the military was slow to help. And the Coronado Bridge has a new suicide barrier. But experts are still looking for a long-term solution. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, Lori Weisberg, who covers marketing and tourism for the San Diego Union Tribune. Reporter John Wilkins, also of the Union Tribune, and KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh. Well, Donald Trump said this week he's not bluffing. He's going to close the border, shut it down, and if it wrecks the economy, tough. Unless Mexico stops the flow north of asylum seekers and undocumented immigrants and drugs immediately. Uh, wait, oh, never mind. The last three days, it hasn't happened since I said we're closing the border. The only thing, frankly, better but less drastic than closing the border is to tear up the cars coming in. And I will do it, just like you, you know I will do it. I don't play games. I'll do it. So we're doing it to stop people. We're going to give them a one-year warning. And if the drugs don't stop or largely stop, we're going to put tariffs on Mexico and products, in particular cars. The whole ball game is cars. It's the big ball game. With many countries, it's cars. And if that doesn't stop the drugs, we close the border. All right, Trump doesn't play games. That's good to know. Business leaders and politicians in both parties warned shutting the border would be disastrous. And Trump's flip-flopping still has plenty of people nervous. That begs the question, what would happen if the border were shut down? And Lori, you wrote this week, uh, the action goes far beyond guacamole and limes for margaritas, right? It's a big deal. That's right. That's right. And, and just to, to, I wrote about this, you know, last November when it happened. And then again this time. And as I was writing this story, I was sort of wondering, is it going to happen? Or is, this, is he really going to back away? And of course he did. But yes, it's, a, it's, it's big. In California, the cross-border trade at the San Diego border is about $75 billion in imports and exports with exports um, to... California outweighing the imports, but it's, it's huge business. I mean, everything from the produce, I mean, about a third of the produce in our supermarkets and where we dine is from, is Mexico grown. And then of course, the biggie is, is the automobiles, the parts for those automobiles, medical devices, furniture. Um, it, it's just a lot of, of goods. Of course, that's why we have NAFTA and hopefully the, uh, the may be the successor to NAFTA. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And uh, you mentioned the uh, impact here regionally. U.S. Chambers of Commerce reports about $1.7 in goods and service, services flows across the entire 2,000-mile border right. daily. daily. And they also say that uh, about a half million legal workers, students, shoppers, tourists cross the border daily, too, as well. So uh, that commercial traffic here crossing, uh, it's a lot of trucks coming through, right? Yeah, about a, about a, at Otay Mesa is where mostly the, tra the truck traffic goes. It's about a million a year. Um, and then you mentioned the, uh, the, just the individuals crossing the border by either pedestrians or car. About, they say about a third of those crossing is for jobs on this side of the border because they're living in Tijuana and coming across here for everything from hospitality jobs to marine terminal jobs to, to whatever. So it's, it, it has such a far-reaching effect when you do shut down the border. Young woman in the newsroom here at KPBS sitting next to me and lives in Tijuana and comes across every day, and we discuss that. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago the border was shut down a few hours in November. Even just that short period had its impact. Yep, $5.3 million impact on the San Ysidro businesses on this side of the border. About 75% just closed for business. It was such a, a big impact. And, you know, it's, it's, even, it's not even when it closes, I mean, of course, that's a big impact, but just the idea of that threat hanging over, it has sort of a lingering effect for a few days because you didn't, you didn't know, would, would that happen again? Right. And as you say, uh, you were writing the story and you're wondering, is he going to flip-flop again on this? We had him um, health care. He was going to introduce health care and replace Obamacare as they launched uh, the, the battle on that lawsuit this week, and he flip-flopped on that. It's good he's in Southern California today, flip-flops are a little more... Uh, 
common around here. Uh, Steve, I'm going to turn to you. Trump's inspecting the border fencing at Calexico Crossing today. You've been out there for past reports. What's the situation over there? I was out there about one year ago um, this month uh, when the <laughs> vice president was out there to inspect this section of the wall. This is a very popular section of the wall, apparently. This was authorized under the Obama administration, paid for under the Trump administration. It's about an 18-mile stretch where they're replacing an existing border fence out there. Interestingly, we'll talk about security in a minute. Interestingly enough, when we were there, they had taken down several sections of wall, and it was just simply opened up. There was no, nobody, there were no, uh, there's no military out there. There was no concertina wire. You could just simply see traffic. Um, but now he's out there today. Um, apparently putting a plaque on Got there. a plaque and everything. Got a plaque. All right, I wanted to shift back to uh, that threat to shut uh, the border. It came this week as, as uh, San Diego business leaders, elected leaders were down for the annual meeting with their counterparts in Mexico City, and I interviewed uh, one participant, Paula Avila, vice president, uh, vice president, I should say, of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. Let's uh, hear what she had to say on Trump shutting the border. You know, it, it's uh, hard to take it seriously because, you know, for those of us who live on the border, we don't see that as a viable option. It's pretty ridiculous, but we've learned that we, we can't just brush off any threats under this administration. We have to take it seriously. And Lori, I want to get to that meeting. The you know this this whole threat of shutting the border and all the focus was in Washington, which unfortunately took away from this big meeting, especially for the regional leaders here in San Diego. They were talking about. Uh, Paola to told me they were talking about three main agenda items, among all the things: uh, a new border crossing, ironically enough, the chronic uh, cross-border sewage problem. We talked about about that on roundtable, and improvements to uh, NAFTA treaty, which I guess now is in trouble in Congress. Um, you know, it's a shame this was kind of overshadowed by this yeah, time. Yeah, when I talked to her kind of mid-visit and I was catching her in between speakers and I said, you know, are, is, is, this the, is this the talk of, the, of your summit? And she said, yes, it seems like the undertone was in everything that they were doing, whether it was the formal presentations by the speakers, talking to the other people there, or when they talked to the government. Some, she acknowledged some of the government people tried to sugarcoat it in, in Mexico and, and not concerned, but others were more honest and they were truly concerned. So yes, um, I'm sure they got a lot done, but I mean, yes, it, it overshadowed the whole visit. She, she did say that. Yeah, kind of all the news that we heard about this week. And uh, I heard a report on NPR just this morning, Carrie Kahn, our uh, NPR correspondent down in, uh, in Mexico City, and they asked her, you know, what about the president there and reacting to that bite we heard earlier at the top? And uh, apparently he's just not taking the bait. And he's saying, look, we need to work with the United States and have cross-border uh, uh, business and commerce and relations, and I think that's the whole San Diego delegation's point of view, too. Right, right. I mean, they, they, they tried, I mean, I don't th obviously, I don't think they got into anything inflammatory, and they tried to stay on point. It is the Chamber of Commerce, after yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. yeah it does seem like <laughs> alternate universes sometimes. You have the people on this coast, in this region, who try to work together and make this happen on a day-to-day -day basis, and then over on the East Coast, you have these, you know, these sort of inflammatory statements about shutting down the border. It's like, Neither, neither universe really talks to each other, and, and they each sort of, especially the one here, has to kind of proceed as if this isn't really going to happen. Right. Otherwise, things will just slow down. So, right. I mean, even the threat of it has an impact it, itself. The kind of this sort and of you have to imagine that uh, his the president's leverage is starting to slip away. The closer we get to an election, if it really does have this kind of an economic impact, are you really going to wait one more year and do some of these things when you're you know you're up for election? It seems like. Um, the window to do this is quickly slipping away. Well, I think I think he's you know when he talked about and boy if they don't if they don't solve things in a year I'm going to get tough and and it sounds scary about because it's about autos but I think he's showing his face that I'm hey look I I may sound like I'm backing away but I'm still getting tough and how tough am I I'm going to you know crack down on these auto chairs which would be obviously a huge impact we said in our own story that uh, you close the border and within uh, tariffs aside. Um, within days it, it would It could have impact. a huge impact yeah. on the Midwest, the which was industry. part of his exactly. base last Detroit, time. Right, yeah. exactly. uh, Steve, as long as you have the floor, I did want to turn to you about the, uh, you wrote about the end of the deployment of troops and they were stringing that concertina wire, which we talked about, of course, on the right. show. Uh, what do you find at the border here now at the end of that process? So a portion of the border mission, and we've had troops along the border since uh, just before the midterm elections in, in October. Part of that mission was set to have wrapped up at the end of March. They 
Uh, they strung about 180 miles of <laughs> concertina wire, about 46 miles of that in California. Uh, we actually took kind of a tour along the border um, and to start, kind of see like what was the outcome here. And um, we found certain spots, no wire at all, certain spots where you're seeing wire from the top of the wall to the bottom. I noticed even reports coming out of Calexico, brand new wall, and they put concertina wire on that in that particular section. The stuff that is near the ocean, the stuff that uh, President Trump had tweeted out, uh, showing that they had covered the wall after on television they saw some migrants climbing up on there. Um, that is starting to show some real signs of, uh, of wear and tear. Uh, some of it is balled up at the base of the wall. There was a secondary fence on the beach and that's all mostly a tangle of wire. We were actually able to talk to the Marines who were laying concertina wire at Otay Mesa back in November went back there to see how it looks part of the wall really just you know strung with concertina wire um, but then other portions of it nothing at all we've been reaching out to the border patrol and homeland security there's they have not really responded as to what the plan was when you talk to department of defense they say we responded to their request and we put the wire where they wanted it and it's now their job to maintain it and protect it or tell us to come back or get it back from those people stealing it down in and Tijuana. down in Tijuana <laughs> okay they also are clear that that's also the responsible responsibility of the Border Patrol there we, go. we won't be sending the Marines down there all right plenty more to talk about this this will be our last bite at this apple we are gonna move on now well the idea as it is when the government turns to the private sector was to save money but complaints are pouring in from military families in San Diego and across the nation about substandard living conditions in private military housing. And Steve, uh, your story this week uh, featured a family of a Marine. He was away on deployment. What happened in her home in Camp Pendleton run by Lincoln Military Housing? Well, we, uh, we went up there last week to talk to Leslie Tomlin, the son, and, uh, who has four kids and uh, her husband is a Marine. And she told us a story of in 2017, they were in military housing up there. She remembers waking up in the middle of the night to her daughter uh, crying and then seeing a mouse opening up the, uh, the uh, uh, turning on the hallway light and mice scattered everywhere. Uh, they, they had to move out for a little bit, they came back. And then it, they, what happened was what she says is basically a, almost a year long journey from March almost to October before they finally got them another house. Uh, where they tried to get uh, Lincoln Housing to clean up. They tried to, the mice still kept coming in. We saw pictures of, of, of different mice uh, that she had taken. Uh, she, she documented this story pretty thoroughly uh, from that, that time. Eventually, she did get a new house, but it took a long time. All right, we're gonna get some more details on that, but we have a bite from, from your story on that. Let's hear from, uh, from the homeowner. I woke up to grab my phone for the flashlight and there, I turned the flashlight on and there was a mouse crawling over my, my pillow. Um, and I, I jumped up and I walked over to the hallway and I turned the flip switch on in the hallway and there was tons of mice just running down my hallway. You could see them coming out of the rooms, just like scampering down the halls and like, I was just so freaked out. I grabbed the kids, we, uh, we like gathered our stuff, like I gathered whatever I could real quick, and we just took off. I should correct myself, she's a tenant, not a, not a homeowner. Couldn't they, uh, you, you said they eventually got a house, it took them a year, couldn't they have called the county health department at that point? Well, that's, she's living on on-base housing, and she told that story much better than I did, certainly. Um, <laughs> well, she lived it, she was shocked. She had to live through it. <laughs> So yeah, this is what you know what she found out when it comes to living in military housing. You have far fewer rights. You're living on base. County health department isn't going to come there and inspect. And this is what we're finding around the country here. Reuters put out a whole series of stories at the end of the year, um, detailing complaints at military housing around the country. Fine work, hard to get into it as other you know for other reporters who hadn't you know had those connections. But now that Congress is getting involved more people are coming forward and they're starting to talk to us about what's happening. So, so Laura? what was the MO of the, of the military? Do they, do they say, hey, it's Lincoln's uh, responsibility, her experience, therefore deal with them? Or did, did she try in vain to get them to intervene and push Lincoln to move faster? I mean, who's, who's, was, 
taking on the responsibility or I, shirking I, it. There you go. So I, I feel like I need to go through some of the history here. Back in 1996, they started privatizing military housing. This was an idea that you could get more housing out there. The housing, military housing was pretty old, decrepit, and they didn't have money in the Pentagon budget. So they decided these public-private partnerships might be the way to go. And it seems to have worked fairly well for a long time, but then we, we see some, uh, there's been uh, a lowering in the amount of um, basic uh, allowance for housing that the, the troops get. Some areas of the country, um, you've seen a drawdown in troops, not really in San Diego, so they're not having the occupancy rates. And so now you're seeing more and more of these problems. And I talked to this CNO the, of, the, of the military, uh, Admiral John Richardson, and he, he conceded that they, they, they didn't really understand these contracts. They're taking a look at them now to find out exactly what their rights, how much authority did they give to these private companies. And, it, and as, as we mentioned, Congress is also taking a look and trying to see if they can maybe get a, a bill of rights for tenants. So you can do simple things like if they don't uh, complete a repair on, in a timely fashion, can a commander just simply take that allowance? Because right now, for most of them, this comes right out of a sailor or a marine's paycheck, so they don't even see it. So not a lot of leverage. And this, they're looking at different ways that might add a little more leverage at this point. And as we mentioned, you referenced here, uh, there are many reports like this across the country here. They sure. feature bats and snakes and cockroaches and maggots and mold, electrical Lots hazards. Lots of things, like issues with mold and substandard electric mm -hmm. and, and uh, cracks. Um, and it was more than a majority. They did this uh, massive uh, survey, as you were saying, 46 states, over 55% said, right. hey, this is, is problematic here. Right, and so right now, how the, the military is responding, yeah, they're taking a look at these contracts. Richardson also talked in terms of, of that maybe they just need some more people uh, at base housing, the folks that are kind of the liaisons between tenants and the military themselves, maybe that would work. Um, and he has set a deadline of next week, April 15th, to go through and anyone who wanted their home inspected to have the commanders come through and do an inspection. They've also come up with, uh, this month they're doing a brand new survey of, of tenants in, in Navy housing and Marine housing just to see what the complaints are and to get a handle on them. Um, but this doesn't seem to be a problem that's going away. In fact, um, we're hearing from more and more people. Now you hear about this, and of course we've heard about all sorts of problems with the VA, we've talked about that on the show and all. At some point, does it, does it affect decisions by service members to extend their military careers or even discourage young people from joining the military in the, the first place? We can't oh. take care of veterans, we can't you know, take care of the housing. Well, sure, they, right now, they are actually, there's a bit of a, a recruitment crisis. The, the Army has not made their numbers. They're trying to recruit people, and they haven't made their numbers. The Navy has some uh, uh, sort of uh, some smaller areas, and areas like pilots, where they're trying to get. So, yes, it does. For a while there, we were starting to draw down. They were, they were having all these retirement incentives to try to get people to maybe consider leaving the military, but we're not in that cycle anymore. So, yeah, See the, what kind of the more of these yeah. stories, the more of these issues, the harder you make it for people to, to make a life in the military, the, uh, the harder it is yeah. to retain them. Well, we'll follow up and see if Congress does anything on that one. We will move on now, though. The blue curving span of the San Diego Coronado Bridge not only offers dazzling views to drivers and passengers in both directions. Sadly, the bridge also attracts those who wish to end their lives in dramatic fashion. More than 400 people have plunged 200 feet to their deaths in the 50 years since the bridge opened. And Caltrans recently added a feature to the Coronado Bridge to discourage suicides. And John, start there. What's been installed here recently? And uh, So they, they put in uh, what are commonly known as bird spikes, so the kind of spikes that you would see put up on a ledge somewhere to keep pigeons from roosting, so they're about four inches tall. And they run along the outside walls on both sides of the bridge. And it doesn't, I mean, as your story described, it's, it's, it's a temporary thing and nobody really thinks physically it's going to do much. Yeah, it is, a, it is a temporary thing and it really sort of falls into the category of more of a psychological deterrent, the idea being that it, somebody going up there who doesn't realize they're there may see them and it may make them stop and think about it. Suicide is very often an impulsive act, so anything that sort of makes them pull away can, uh, can be a favorable thing. Any kind of pause, and uh, always difficult to, to know motives and what's going on when we're talking about suicide and this, this whole sad topic, but uh, in the first 24 hours, it didn't seem to work at all. Yeah, three people <clears throat> go up there and commit suicide, yeah. and, and again, every case is, is, is its own tragedy, so you really don't know what the factors were, but there's, there is a little bit of uh, thinking that uh, 
some of the media coverage of the spikes going in may have may have made people yeah. think more about going up there. And we, so. and we don't really know. Yeah. Uh, Lori? Uh, so did the, um, so you said this was always intended to be a temporary measure. Did, did, the, um, did they look at, I know you <coughs> looked at what other um, cities with bridges have done, but did they look at whether the, the bird spikes had been effective at all in other? Um, I don't know of any place where they've put them up. Uh, those short, oh. only four inches. Oh, the, oh that, this is yeah. unusual. Okay. This, that idea actually came up during community discussions in Coronado about what to do. One of the residents of Coronado actually said, have you thought about doing something like this? Mm. And his idea was actually a taller kind of bird thistle kind of shape. And so Caltrans just came up with this idea to try and do something on a temporary basis and while I, they pursue the longer term. And not costly, ideas. obviously. It's just to see what happens well, with this. Right. It depends on, yeah. It depends on what you consider costly, right? $420,000, yeah. I guess, to Caltrans is not very much money, but yeah. that's, that's what they spent on and the And certainly spikes. a bridge this size. Well, let's talk about uh, those hearings. What are some suggestions regarding uh, permanent barriers? What might they cost? What are some of the obstacles? And yeah, so there, there are sort of three main ideas that they're looking at. One is, one is a, uh, several variations of a wire mesh fence usually about eight or nine feet tall. And those kind of are patterned after a fence they put in on a bridge in Santa Barbara, the Cold Spring Bridge, where they'd had about 55 people commit suicide. And they put that fence up and it's essentially stopped it. Um, they had one early on and they figured out something they needed to do on the sides to keep people from going around the beginning of the bridge of the fence barrier. Uh, so that's one idea. The other. Uh, patterned after glass panels that they have on a bridge in Auckland, New Zealand. And the th third main area they're looking at is a nets underneath the bridge, which are patterned after what are being installed at the Golden Gate Bridge right now. Mm -hmm. Lori? Oh, so, our, I mean, I know having read your story that um, they're looking ahead at what this was gonna cost, but where would the, would the are they, Thinking that Caltrans would be funding all this, or um, is that, and is there yeah, well enough that's, in the budget for that? That is one of the big, uh, big hurdles they'll face is how to fund it. I mean, uh, some of the ideas go up to 110 million dollars, so um, it would be expensive. You know, Caltrans has a budget way in excess of that every year. So um, I think the thinking right now, what they're looking at, is they're planning another series of uh, meetings with various stakeholders. I think are going to happen sometime later this month. And by the end of the year, I think they hope to narrow it down to maybe a handful of ideas. Uh, they'd scope those out and then go, go into the budgeting process and say, give us some money to start moving forward with this. And your story notes that suicides have been a sad fact uh, uh, since that bridge opened in 1969, if yeah. I recall. Uh, why is there momentum now for a physical solution? Well, I mean, er, early on there was agitation in some groups, especially religious leaders were trying to get people to do something and it just got nowhere. In fact, the mayor of Coronado at the time said, we're not going to do anything to this beautiful bridge. And so it never really got anywhere. But, but lately you've had some, uh, actually some politicians in the area who are behind the idea. Uh, ben Hueso actually came at it from the other side. He represents Coronado, but also the area with Chicano Park. You remember a couple of years ago, we had a truck go over the side into the park and kill four people. And so he actually was pushing for something to be done at that end. And actually they did put up what's known as a debris fence at that, so at that end to try and keep vehicles from going over and now. Coming down the grade and. You know. Well, yeah, from going over the side of the bridge yeah. and, uh, and into the park, which right. is what happened with that pickup truck. Yeah. And so um, you have people who uh, control the purse strings of Caltrans in Sacramento who are, who are interested in this idea. And so uh, I think uh, it's all made Caltrans take the idea a little more seriously. And, and I think it is, this is, uh, I, I did a story, a series of stories on uh, uh, veteran suicide, and in the latest figures, 2017, San Diego took over from LA as the number one, uh, more veterans in San Diego County killed themselves than any other county, over, they overtook LA. And you start looking around for some of the reasons, and I wouldn't even dismiss bird spikes. I mean, from what I found out is like, you c it's very difficult to tell when somebody's about to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of risk factors out there. TBIs, being an older white male, can be one of mm -hmm. is one of those mm -hmm. risks. But it's hard to tell when somebody's going to kill themselves. And it is. It's that small moment. I you know, I found out that uh, your dog can come up to you and start licking your face. And uh, I mean, nine veterans have killed themselves just by jumping off that bridge over the from 2013 to, to 2017. I mean, it's nothing compared to handguns more than half of right. uh, veterans killed themselves with, with handguns, but it is 
an attractive nudes and even small things. Though it does surprise me that they haven't done much more up in the, even, even something that might include putting some sort of pedestrian walkway that would be enclosed so you could do something productive as far as you know opening up that, that area and just make it just a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. right. John, do we know why people are attracted to bridges? Well, I mean, there are people who've studied it, and one of, the, one of the reasons why, if they become iconic, like the one here is, and certainly the Golden Gate Bridge, which is the leading, probably the leading suicide magnet in the world, certainly in this country. Um, so, the, so, so structures that are notorious in that way, and, and then the more that suicides happen there, the more notorious they get. But bridges over water, in particular, have sort of this uh, almost romantic idea. Uh, people go up there with the idea that jumping off a bridge is somehow going to be a peaceful, almost painless death, and it isn't. All right, well, we're going to follow up on this and see what's, uh, what's done as we go forward. Another story to follow up on, excellent story. Well, before signing off today, we want to mention the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's 1-800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K. It's a resource for anyone who may need someone to talk to. And that does uh, wrap up. We're out of time here. Wraps up another week of stories on the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Lori Weisberg of the San Diego Union Tribune, John Wilkins, also of the Union Tribune, and Steve Walsh of KPBS News. And a reminder, all the stories we discussed today available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today.